right side up. And they made a comment when they were reporting them. They said, look at these guys. They have turned the world upside down. They've turned the world upside down. They brought the good news. They brought the message of salvation and they brought the message of hope. They brought the message of deliverance. They brought the message, the, the gospel that brings salvation to all men. And they said, they accused them of turning the world upside down. They didn't say they turned Jerusalem upside down. They didn't say they turned Bethlehem upside down. They said they turned the whole world upside down. By that time, the gospel hadn't spread around the world. The gospel hadn't come to Africa. It, didn't, it wasn't even in, probably it wasn't even in, in the UK then. But they said they turned the world upside down. What they were doing, they weren't turning the world upside down. They were turning the world right side up because the world was straying away from his savior. The world was turning away onto all kinds of idolatry. The world was turning away into all kinds of hero worship. The world was turning away into all kinds of satanic practices. So much so as we have in our world today. When you put, put on your suit on Sunday morning and you say you're going to church or when you get into the commercial road and say I am evangelizing, people look at you and they think you're turning the community upside down. But what you're really doing is you're turning lives right side up. You're turning praise back to God. You're turning glory back to God. You're bringing praise to the name of God. That's what you're really doing. 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 You're bringing praise to God. You're bringing glory to God. You're turning the heart of men back to their creator. You're turning the heart of men back to their creator. You're turning, you're changing the focus from sin, from unrighteousness, from all kinds of evil that lives in our world today. You are turning the focus. You are turning the light back on unto Jesus. You are exalting the name of Jesus. You are bringing glory to the name of Jesus. The Bible says, let your light so shine that men may see your good works and give glory to God. When you are in that workplace and you stand upright for righteousness, when you are in that workplace and you do your job on time, get to work on time, deliver your reports on time, live an excellent life, show forth the glory of God in everything that you do. What you are doing is that you are turning the world right side up. You are showing an example and you are showing how things should be done. Many of us think that when we commit our hearts to Jesus, many of us think that when we focus on serving God, many of us think that when we leave everything else and follow the way of the master, that we are going to, well, we are going to miss out on some things. We think that we're going to change ourselves. Sometimes you feel like, oh, you know, I don't want to go all crazy up on gospel because if I go this far into the gospel, I'm going to just be like a pastor. What's wrong with being like a pastor anyway? What's wrong with being like a pastor anyway? I never wanted to get close to pastors. I don't like it. Because then they will remember there's a branch that can be somewhere. I'm not mentioning names. But do you know, if I didn't get to pastor, I wouldn't be in my destiny right now. It may sound very light what he's spoken about, but it's a major issue. I would not be in the path of my destiny because I know that what I'm doing right now is what God ordained for me to do. I know that I'm doing, I know that God is using me to change lives. I don't know about tomorrow, but I know about today and I know what happened before today, that I'm in the line of my destiny. I'm fulfilling purpose. I'm happy. I'm doing the things that makes God happy. I'm turning lives around for God. I'm happy. When couples come in and say, oh, we need counseling. Oh, we're going to go separate. We're going to do this. And they're so angry and so venomously, they, they, almost like they hate each other. And we sit down with them day one, day two, day three, a week, a month, maybe sometimes even months. And suddenly turn around, I see them one Sunday coming to church and they're holding hands together and they're smiling. Do you know what happens to me? I feel like dancing. I feel like going crazy because somebody's life is just been from somebody's life has just been changed. That is my destiny. That's my destiny. That's what I want to do. I want to please God. All my life, what I was looking for was what I was going to do. I didn't know that I needed to concentrate on what God needed doing. You know, how we also, and even I remember those days back in Nigeria when I wanted to go to university, it was important that I studied engineering because then when you study engineering, you'll be able to get a job in the oil industry. And when you get a job in the oil industry, you're going to be in this pathway and that pathway. And my mom retired, you know, as a leader in the NNPC. So I knew that if I studied chemical engineering, I'm going to get a job in this way. I'm going to get a job in that way. And that person is going to recommend me. And that person is going to recruit me. And this is, this is how much they make in that sector. All those things are good and beautiful. All those things are nice and beautiful. But what do you do? What do you do? What do you do when God comes calling? What do you do when God comes knocking? Oh, don't think that when I say God comes knocking, I mean that you're going to become a pastor. Not everybody's going to be on the pulpit. Not everybody's going to be a preacher. Not everybody's going to be a teacher. Not everybody's going to be a prophet. He might even be within that. He may even be within that. 
your mathematics. It may be within that your assignment, that thing that you love so much. I like painting. I want to be an artist. I like looking after children. I like this. I like that. Those passions that you're craving for. Have you ever wondered and stopped for a moment to think that maybe God put them in there? That maybe God sowed those seeds inside of me so that when they come to fruition, they can bring glory to his name. So that they can bring honor to his name. I know that there are lots of young people here today. When I say young, I mean people about my age-ish, you know. So don't think that I mean that you're very young. I know, you, I know you just look good. You're not that young, okay? You look after yourself. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Can I be honest to you? There is a cry in the heart of God. In 2005, we were at Oasis Center. How many of us know Oasis Center? So we all know Oasis Center, right? Oh, come and respond. Do you know Oasis Center? Do you know Oasis Center? All right, okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's new for me. <laughs> right, okay. Um, so at Oasis Center, I was preparing. Um, I was going to lead the night vigil. I was going to preach and pray at the night vigil. And I was preparing, 2005. And as I was praying, I was supposed to, I think I was supposed to talk about the nation and pray, something like that. And as I was preparing, I heard God say to me that even though this nation has bowed itself to idol, and even though this nation had gone af away after my heart, say, yet, yeah, just like in the days of Elijah, I have prepared my for myself, I have prepared for myself, you know, young men and women who will raise the banner, and there shall be another wave of glory before the eventual coming. I was so scared to say it, because it's a big word. I don't want to go and prophesy, and it doesn't happen, <laughs> you know. I'm not, you know, I'm like, God, why are you telling me this? He said, because you've been crying out to me all week, passionately praying for this nation, and I want you to know what's going to happen. I said, God, so when I came and said I was going to come and study masters at the University of Postman, it was a setup. I wish God didn't answer me, and I heard yes. So it was a setup. I was dreaming of, you know, studying masters in information systems, and I was hustling, and you know how I went through paying my fees? It was a difficult experience. You know, I, we, 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 we labored, we, we, we studied, we did everything we could do. We wanted to have good careers, and, and I still do have, you know, we do have good careers. Don't misunderstand me. But the thing is that those things are not as important to us anymore as to touching lives and changing people's lives and turning people's hearts to God. That's the ultimate. That's the most important thing. Whether you're sweeping the floor, whether that's your chosen career, whether you're working in care, whether that's your chosen career or not, whatever you're doing, let the paramount thing in your heart be to turn the world right side up. Let in your own little corner, let there be an influence. Let there be a change. Let there be a change in your neighborhood. Let, there, let your roommate feel the anointing. Let your neighbor know that the glory of God lives inside of you. Be a different human being. Touch everyone in every corner. The Bible says the mountain of the lost house shall be exalted as chief amongst other mountains. And all the nations of the earth will run into it. How can the mountain of the Lord that you see today, how can the church that you see today be exalted as chief amongst other mountains? There are all kinds of mountains in the world today. There is the mountain of Isis. There is a mountain of government. There is a mountain of laws and legislations. There is mountains of homosexuality. There is all kinds of mountains flying up around and all over the place. The Antichrist manifests himself in all kinds of ways. But listen to me carefully. The glory of the Lord will be revealed. The question is not whether or not it will be revealed. The question is, are you going to be a part of the wave of the glory? That the question is not whether God is not going to move or not. God is going to move. He said there will be another wave of glory. In other words, there will be another conversion. This nation is going to turn around again to Jesus. Amen. The question is really, is are you going to be part of those people who are taking the gospel into your office, into your community, into your business meetings, into, into, into every nook and cranny, wherever you go, are you going to be one of those people who are going to be touching people and changing lives per, the, per second? Are you going to be one of those people whose lifestyle alone ministers the gospel? Are you going to be one of those people whose lifestyle alone ministers the gospel? Are you going to be one of those people whose world touches hearts of people and breaks their heart down till they see Jesus? Do you reflect the glory? I read somewhere that 99% of the world does not read the Bible, both Christians and non-Christians alike. Only 1% of humanity actually read the Bible regularly. The rest of the 99% read the 1% that read the Bible. The 99%, they read the 1% that don't read the Bible. What category do you belong? What category do you belong? The 99 or the 1%? These guys were bringing the gospel. They brought the gospel is the good news. 
the good news of salvation. Jason was not even the one preaching. Jason just believed. Paul wasn't even the one arrested here. They, they, they hid him, the, the brothers hid him away. But this guy, they said they just took him. He didn't say, oh no, I'm not the one. You know, like Peter did. Peter said, Jesus, oh boy, I don't know Jesus. <laughs> he didn't do that. He stood his ground for the gospel. Do you know some of the letters you read today, some of the extremely motivational, powerful gospel that we read today are the words of a man who was locked up for, for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of the gospel. I was asking a friend of mine, I said, I don't know how people in the, in, in the areas where terrorism is so active, I don't know how they're coping. Because I asked myself, if you, as a pastor, if there was a bomb thrown in my church today, will I ask people to come back just immediately the next week? I would feel like, oh, am I being responsible or not? You know, I would feel worried. Like, we need to put security in place, we need to do this and we need to do that before I ask people to come back. But you know, go back to Nigeria, go back to all these other countries where these things are happening. In the immediate next Sunday, people are gushing back again into church. I'm like, where do I stand? Am I going to tell these people not to come to church? Or am I going to tell them to come? But these guys are bold. These guys are confident. They're not afraid to lose their life. They feel that by staying away from church, the enemy has won. And they are not afraid to lose their life. Next. You might ask me then, where is all their aspiration and their engineering and their BSc and their MSc and their PhD and where is their wives and husbands and dreams? When I was very little, I used to pray a prayer to God. I said, God, I know that you're coming. I know Jesus is coming back again, but please, wait till I get married before you come. Oh, I know you never pray that kind of prayer. You just, you know, but surely, you know, you guys are just solid. Have you ever invited people to come church? I was like, I think I was probably like 10, 11. And I remember because I used to pray like, God, no, just let me get married before you come. Because with, with, they told us, and I knew that you couldn't, because I became a Christian, at, I think I was probably 10 plus or something like that. You can't do anything before you become. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Once the Lord spoke, twice I heard it. So you can interpret the rest of your <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Nehemiah. Oh my God. Nehemiah. He was standing. He was doing his job. He was a cup bearer. He was doing his job. His job was to serve the king's dreams. It was not quite the most dignified job in the world at that time because he was a slave. The Bible says that the king looked at him and said, I have never, chapter one, I have never seen you wear a weary face in my presence. I have never seen you so sad. I have never seen you so bogged down. What is troubling you? What was troubling Nehemiah? The Bible says that the gates of Jerusalem and the temple and the city were light was in ruins. Who ruined the city? It was the king. He was, he was the one who came to conquer Jerusalem and laid all the lands of Judah. He, he broke them down and destroyed them and took most of their able young men captive. He said, I, my friend came from the city and gave a report of what was going on. Do you not feel bogged down when you hear, do you not know that the spiritual Jerusalem is the church? Zion has come to the church. The church, let me, revive, let me just take you back quickly. John chapter 4, when Jesus was talking to, to the woman at the well, he said, whether on this mountain or on that mountain, no, we will not worship in any of those mountains again. Because the hour has come, and now is, when true worshippers will worship in spirit and in truth. He says, when you, Paul now says, when you come together, and the spirit of the Lord is with you, that is the church. So the church is the Zion, is the Jerusalem of God. It's the Jerusalem of God. This is where we bring God glory. This is where we bring God praise. And so when you see that the church light in ruins, when you see that the church is becoming worldly and the world is becoming the church, when you see that the church is not no longer following the ways of God, when you see that the membership of the church, the committed people, people who truly serve Christ are depleting by the day, does it not bother you? Does, do you not realize that the gates of the temple are laying in ruins right now? Does it not bother you? Does it not worry you? Do you, know, do you feel comfortable and you're just happy within yourself that the gates of the temple lies in ruins? Nehemiah wasn't comfortable. He gave, up his, he gave up his job. His comfortable position, he gave it up. He went to the king, stood before the king what he shouldn't have done. He spoke out to the king what he shouldn't have done. 
He went on his journey, took every young man. He told them to sell everything they had, their, their gold, their silver, their timbers and their wood. He went back to Jerusalem, who drove around the town. I mean, rode around the town. He went everywhere, saw the ruins. He broke down into tears. He says, and I began to fast and pray to my God. And I began to repent of the sins of the land. And I began to pray like this. And he began to say out his prayers. He began to pour his heart out for God, interceding for the church, interceding for the church. A person who, is, who wants to turn the, right, the, the world right side up must first of all begin at home. Charity begins at home. You must turn your own neighborhood, your own community church. You must turn it up, right side up. I was just busy turning business to, I mean, possible right side up when Pastor Ayo called me to, to go and serve. Every time we had programs and I would jump forward. I just wanted to serve God. That was what was in my mind. I didn't care whether I was going to be any leader or anything. I don't care about the title. Half of our church don't even come in, Pastor. I don't care. I don't, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It, it's, it's irrelevant. Jesus is coming back again. All that is just irrelevant to me. Paul says everything I consider gain, I consider them now lost for the excellency of the every word call that Christ has called me. I am not asking you to jump out of school. I am not asking you to give up your marriage. That's not what I'm saying. I'm asking you to make God priority. Make God first in your life. Let him be happy before you become happy. I'm not asking you to give up your dreams. If God is not asking for it, I'm not asking for it. All I'm asking for is to be open. All I'm asking for is to have your heart open. You know there are some areas of our lives where we have put zip on. We zipped it up. We have secured the God that didn't get there. And we come to church on Sunday. Ah, you know, I can't sing, but you know, I surrender all. And then you go like, oh, oh, and we just wash it. Every time I sing that song, I feel guilty. Because I know I have not surrendered all. I know I haven't surrendered all. The, what I mean by that is that there are still areas of my life where God says, you know what, I want to, if God asks me now to leave everything and move to maybe Cambodia or something, I will struggle. Or Afghanistan, I will struggle a little bit. My hope and prayer is that at the end of the day, I will obey. When I was asked to operate myself from Basingstoke to, I mean from Postmo to Basingstoke, I struggled a bit. I used my wife as a bait. I said, we just got married. And I told her, that her dad is a missionary. I said, Okay, I, I promised her that I will never put her through that kind of stress again. Because her dad was so, was so rich, and then suddenly he gave up everything for ministry. So I said, oh, you know, I'm not going to put you through that again. You're going to be fine. I'm going to make money. Pastor Ayon knows. Those days, they ask me, what's your calling? I said, make money for the gospel. I want to bankroll the gospel. I used to say that, I want to bankroll the gospel. If you see, this pub used to be a church. I'm buying it. I just buy it. I said, oh, you, you want to pastor? Go, go, take it. That was my thing. I wasn't, I'm serious. That was what I used to think then. Like, I, you know, I just... Have loads of money, like billions of pounds. And I said, hey, if you don't change that law right now, I'm going to move my businesses to um, Switzerland, and the government will be panicking. You know, that kind of remote control. <laughs> that, was, that was the kind of bully I wanted to be. I wanted to be like a bully, you know. I wanted to bully the, the, the government, bully, bully, bully my way into, into power, with the, you know, putting the gospel first, but obviously using money. But that was not what God wished for me. That might be what God wished for somebody else, but that's not necessarily what God wished for me. And God said to me, he said, if I give you that kind of money, <laughs> I have to break you first. He says, I, will I have to break you. He said, I have to break you before I can bless you. I have to break you before I can bless you. The number one point I want to make to you today, for those who are going to turn the world upside down, the, the charity begins at home. You start from home. You start from your local church. You start from your community. You start with your wife and your husband and your children. You start with your parents. You start with your family. You start with your career. You start in the things that you can control. The things that are within your control, you start from there. You, it starts from there. There is nothing. You cannot change the world. You cannot fulfill your dreams if you're not passionate enough. I see a lot of people who like nice things. They say very lovely things. Oh, I want to have a motherless baby's home where I will look after children. If you're not passionate enough about it, you're, keep, you're going to keep saying it. You become 70 years of age, you're still going to keep saying it. 100 years of age, say, I wish I still had the strength to do them. Because you're not passionate enough about it. Because you're looking at what I'm going to do, what will I do, what will I do. You're not thinking about, you're, you're, sorry, you're thinking about how I'm going to do it. You're thinking about how, 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 and why, 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 why. I want to find my purpose, I want to find my dream. Why don't you try and find the purpose of God? And look at what, is, what God is passionate about right now. Why don't you put yourself in that place and keep doing that. And in that place, God will establish his words concerning you. Let me tell you the truth. I was working in the NHS. IT help desk. And I was frustrated. I have a master's. I, was, I had a good job before I came to this country. Very amazing job. And I left everything. Studied 
thought I was going to get a good job and I was on the help desk. It was not bad, but it was not what I wanted. I'll be honest with you, I was still doing some other kinds of jobs, many old jobs to, to support things, to add things together. And I just got the job like December or January or something like that. And by March, we were already being told to go to Basingstoke. And so whilst we were going to Basingstoke, I was struggling. I mean, from Postmore to Basingstoke, I was struggling a little bit because, you know, the finance wasn't quite right for me. I, I, you know, my dreams weren't quite aligning. And, you know, the guy that wanted to have all the money in the world, you know, the thing, things were in hard enough, but I didn't, nobody would know unless those who were very close, like Bonchela and all the rest, they probably would be surprised I'm saying this now. But I looked all right. It looked like everything was okay. You know, I was wearing a good smile. I was all happy. I mean, I just got married to the girl of my dream. So, you know, I was just, you know, I was just all over the place, joyous and happy, but just trusting God inside. Say, God will bring me to pass. And so, it got to a point where we knew that the work in Basingstoke could not progress unless we moved to Basingstoke. We knew that. Okay? So, the, well, after like six months, we knew that. But the battle now was, okay, if I get a good job there, or around that area, we're going to move. That was the target. So, we kept looking for jobs. I was hustling and applying and doing everything. I was frustrated on my job so much so that one day I shouted on my boss. I was frustrated. I didn't feel like waking up to go to work. I didn't like what I was doing. I wanted more challenge and I wanted more money. One day, suddenly, it just occurred to me that I'm putting the cart before the horse. So I said to my wife, what if we decide and go to Basingstoke and start looking for cows? And then when we will get the house and we move to Basingstoke, then the job will come one day. Because it's better to obey God first of all than to put my own dream and aspirations before God. It is not as though that God doesn't want my dreams and aspirations to be fulfilled, but he wants to take the pride of place in my life. Because, oh yes, I'm passionate about people, but I have to be passionate about God as well. I've got, my life must bring him glory. My life must bring him praise. We are like we are like the animals set forth for sacrifice. We are like the animals set forth for sacrifice. Paul says we apostles in Corinthians. He says we are like those who have been set forth as an example, being killed for the sacrificial giving. We are like those being killed for the sacrificial giving, so that the glory of God may be revealed. He said we are hard pressed on every side. He said, but yet we are not destroyed. We are broken, but we are coming back together. He said, we carry upon our body every day the marks of the pain of the gospel. I'm not here moaning to you, and I'm not trying to sweet talking into ministry. I am not even asking you to become a pastor. I'm not even asking you to go get your Bible and go out on evangelism tomorrow. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you flinging your heart open and making God's passion your passion, and then see what it does with you. Then see what it does with your job. See what it does with your relationships. See what it does with your parents. See what it will do with your wife. See what it will do with your uncle that doesn't know God. See what it will do with those things in your life that you are so passionate about. See how he's going to turn your life around. God is looking for people who are going to turn the world right side up. God is looking for people who will show the good example, who will show his love, who will show his grace. Those who will show his grace to the people, who will show his loving kindness to the people, who will reveal his beauty and his splendor to the people. He's waiting to exalt the church. He's waiting to turn his glory upon us. He's waiting to turn the focus on us. But we've got to be ready. We've got to be ready. We cannot be ready if we're not passionate about him. We cannot be ready if we're not crazy in love with him. We cannot be ready if we're not bad, bold, audacious, decisive believers. Bold, confident, bold, audacious, invulnerable to persecution, invulnerable to, to, to oppression, invulnerable to, 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 to suppression, saying, you know, this is my destiny. My destiny is to bring glory to God. My destiny is to bring worship to God. My destiny is to reveal the glory of God. My destiny is to make God proud. My destiny is to bring him glory. My destiny is to bring him worship. My destiny is to make God proud. It's that God will rise on his throne and say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I am running every day, not as one who has attained. I'm running, I'm pushing forward, I'm pressing on every day. Not as somebody who has attained anything. I have not even, I press on as though I've never led one soul to Christ. I press on every day as if I've never preached a single good sermon. I press on every day as though nothing in my life is important. That I for the excellency of the every word call that God has called me. I lay everything, every trophy, every blessing, I put them behind me and I press on each day. I press on each day towards the mark of the high calling. It's a high calling, friends. It's not a joke. The glory of the Lord will be revealed when we come to a point in our lives when we lay everything back and say, here I am. Use me. Here I am. Send me. Here I am. I'll go. Use me for your glory. 
Use me for your glory. Take this my job. Use it for your glory. Take this my home. Use it for your glory. These are my kids. Lord, they are a blessing from you. Use them for your glory. Those are the words. Those are the prayers of a person who is passionate about his God. That's, those are the words. Those are the prayers of a person who is passionate, who is in love with Jesus. It's not just about those who sing, but you have to be bold because oppression will come. Opposition will come. You will doubt yourself, like, what am I really doing? Your wife will doubt you. Your husband will doubt you. But when you are persistent and they see the truth and you're in prayer, they will come around to you. They will turn around. They will be your best fan. They will be, bring your best support. You have to be bold. I said bad, bold, audacious, invulnerable to every circumstance. See, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the, is the boldness to continue even in the face of opposition. You need to keep pressing on. He said, I press on, I press on. I'm chasing after God. I press on. What's the eye calling of God in Christ Jesus? I just keep pressing on. The world is lying in darkness. We're groping. You know what it means to grope in darkness? You're trying to look for the matchbox or the candlelight or something, and the lights are out. And if you're from Nigeria, you have a good experience of that. And you're going and you're just, you're, you're just feeling the place. Oh, children, where did you take the matchbox from here? This is where I normally keep it. How many times your parents fought you for that? You know, you're just looking around for the lamp. You're looking for the matches and you're grouping. You don't know where things are. You're just looking. You fall over. The cups fall. The glass breaks. The chair tumbles. This one falls around. That's what's going on in the world. The world is in an opera. The world is in a chaos. The world is in need of a savior. The world is in need of a savior. We don't, nobody has a solution any longer. But here seated in this church, I believe in my spirit, is somebody with a solution. He has seated in this church today. He's somebody with a solution to the basic store council. He has seated today. He's somebody with a solution to the ministry of the gospel in this town. He has seated today with somebody with some idea of a design or something that will bring the world back to a place where we can refocus on God. I'm not asking you to leave your job. I'm not asking you to leave your family. Only God can ask you for that. Only God can ask you to give up something. I cannot ask you to give it up. Only God can ask you to give it up. But when it does come knocking, are you prepared? Are you passionate enough to give it all up? Listen to me, whatever you give up, God will bring it back to you. He will bring it around back to you. I have seen it. I'm, I'm speaking my own personal testimony right here. Right? You know, this is homecoming for me. So this is my testimony I'm sharing with you right now. God will come full circle. He will come true for you. He will come true for you. I quadrupled my income in the first job I got after I left first month. That's four times what I was earning. Four times. The next job I got was four times what I was earning when I was in Postmont. I used to think that Postmont was the headquarter of Jesus. I didn't know that wherever I went, Jesus was the, that was the headquarter of Jesus. But the trouble though is that Pastor Yotu is here. So, let me be politically correct. <laughs> Postmont is the headquarter of Jesus! Shout hallelujah! It's busy still. <laughs> hallelujah! Glory be to the name of the Lord. I've told you three things in one. Or four things now, I've told you. I've told you about beginning at home. Just releasing yourself, just opening your heart to the Lord, right? Out of all this talk, I don't want you to miss the critical things. And I've told you about being bold, being audacious, being decisive, being determined, being fully persuaded. He said, I am fully persuaded hey, that nothing in this life not even in death. Not, no, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. The revelation of God's love is embedded in the revelation of Christ. So if you understand Christ and you're born again, you receive Christ's love. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to tell you some other things before the, my time rounds up so that you can have something to refer back to when you leave here. Because I have experienced it. That when you're in church and all and the spirit of the Lord is there and everybody's jumping up and we're all happy in the presence of God, you're excited, you make some commitment to God. Uh, a week after that, two weeks after that, three weeks after that, <laughs> and you forget completely. You know, when the bills, when, when the guys who want to collect your bills, they come knocking at the door, you forget. And I don't blame you, I've, I've been through it as well. Several times I've been through it, I've decided, Lord, ah, Jesus, hey. And then I just, I get so excited. Say, come forward. I run forward. Ah, pastor, please. Ah. <laughs> Anoint my head with oil. You know, this is what I want to do. Lord Jesus. And I will just be praying. Ah, and I can shout when I'm praying sometimes. You know, I'm just going crazy and all of that. And then you leave a month after, two months after. It's all gone. I find the miracle of writing things down very, very rewarding. 
that when I go back into those notes, or maybe the, the recording, the, the, the experience that I had in that moment often tends to come back. Do you get me? The revelations you had in that moment tends to come back. It tends to come back. So please, make it a habit. The people who will turn the world upside down must hate mediocrity. How many of you have ever heard about, I think it's a book called The Enemy Called Average. The Enemy Called Average. Okay, that's a long time ago, but those who are going to change the world must not be satisfied easily. I'm not talking about money, obviously, but I'm talking about a lifestyle, a nature, making it your nature that you don't get satisfied easily. Some of you are so comfortable with where you are today, you cannot see beyond your nose. You're so comfortable with where you are today that you don't realize that there is much more that you can do for God. You don't realize there's much more you can do for yourself. There's much more you can do for your family. If you need to get an education to go to the next level in your life, go and get it. I don't care what your age is. Go and get it. It doesn't matter what you have done already. It doesn't matter what you've achieved already. If there is something else that you need to do to be able to get to where God wants to take you, go and get it. Go and get it done. Don't be satisfied with where, to, where, to, where you are. Don't be satisfied with where you are. I read a report that says there was a research that was done. All over the country, about 4,500 children were assessed. And they said, the children with the lowest IQ seem to be the children who go to churches. That was last year, I read it. Now, of course, I know that's not true. I know it's not true. I know what the devil was striking at. You know, all these things are being calculated, I'm being arranged. I'm withholding myself from giving you some information now because I don't want you to dwell on those information. I want you to be determined to serve God in a different way from today. That's my focus. So within the time that I have, I'm trying to discipline myself to focus you on the word of God. Listen to me and let me tell you about, about Moses. Moses had made a mistake because Moses knew by revelation. Listen to me carefully. Moses knew by revelation that he was ordained to deliver the people. Now, the Bible didn't say that. I said it. The reason I know is because when Moses killed the guy who was fighting with the, the Jew guy, he says he thought that by killing that guy, they would recognize that it was through his hand that he were, God was going to deliver the people. Moses knew already. And he ran away for 40 years. 40 years he ran away. And even when God called him and says, Moses, it's time to deliver the people, he turned around and said to God, I can't speak. And I can understand because he's been beaten. I can understand because he's made mistakes. I can understand because he can no longer live to the standard in his own eyes. He can no longer live to the standard that God required of somebody who was going to bring deliverance to his people. You may look at yourself and you change yourself. You look down on yourself. You forget that the saving grace of God has come to you. You forget that with the grace of God is forgiveness. God said, even if your conscience is dealing with you, he said, God is greater than your conscience. What is important is that you don't go back and do those things again. Whatever may have happened in the past in your life, all of it, God will bring it together to take you to your place of destiny. Don't worry about the bad things that have happened. Don't worry about the fact that you grew up in a home without a father. Don't worry about the fact that you had two abortions when you were young. It doesn't matter right now because you are born again. God will use it. God will turn it around. It was bad. You did a bad thing, but that was then. God will take it and turn it around and push you towards your destiny. All the good things, all the ugly things, all the bad things, all the not very bad things, all the not very good things, all the excellent things, all the poor things, everything all together. God will bring them together and use them to take you to where he wants you to be in life. The key thing is determining that you'll never go back down that road again. You don't have to stay in that place. You don't have to stay in that place. People who want to go far, people who want to turn the world upside down for God, they make up their mind. They are determined. They are determined to follow the Lord. They make up their mind. They are determined to follow the Lord. They are determined to do it God's way. They won't let their past stop them. They won't let mediocrity stop them. They won't let their, the, the things they can see stop them. They are people who walk by faith. That's another one for you. They are not people who walk by what they see or what they feel. They walk by faith. They believe the word of God. Joshua and Caleb went to look at the line. They went to look 
went, they went to spy Jericho. And, and all the other ten, other 10 guys from the other tribes said to, to Moses, says, that place is so terrible. You know, I mean, those sons of Anakims were living in those places. Those guys are giants. Even though that place flowed with milk and honey. But, oh, Moses, we can take that land. They're going to bring us down. They're going to break us down. Oh, they were giving all kinds of negative reports. Joshua and Caleb stood different from the people. And they said to Moses, we know those people are giants. We know those people are great. But as God has said that he will give us the land. We believe that we are strong and we are well able to go up and take the land. You know, I always ask myself, what criteria did Moses use to choose between Joshua and Caleb? Have you ever asked that question? Why did Caleb not become the leader? Of course, Caleb was not originally a Jew. He's a Kenizah. Okay? So he was part of the mixed multitude that followed them out of the land of Egypt. That was one. But I thought God doesn't care about things like that sometimes. You know, God just lets it go sometimes. Because he represented the tribe of Israel in the spy. So I was thinking to myself, why, why? I wasn't satisfied with the fact that he wasn't Jewish. That was not enough for me. I found something in scripture. And this is where I'm going to round it up. I found something in scripture. And it blew my mind. And I'll call it devotion. When Moses went to the mountain to pray, and he delayed in the mountain when he was conversing with God, and Aaron, his brother, had made a golden calf to the people. When Moses came back down, God was angry with the people. You remember that story? God was very angry with the people. And God said, move the tabernacle, where the tent of, you know, like maybe the church, as, you know, as you will say, move the tabernacle, move the tent of meeting, move it away from the, from the inside the camp, move it outside the camp. Listen, please follow me carefully. He says, move it outside the camp. And so when they moved it outside the camp, the Bible says every morning when Moses rose up to go and worship and pray for the people and to repent of their sins because they, were, they, were, they felt bad after God chastised them and all of them were so afraid to come into the temple because they, were, they had committed sin against God. The Bible says all the leaders of each family would stand outside of their camp, outside of their room, and they would stand there and they would watch, watch Moses walk through the entire camp and go into the tabernacle outside of the camp to go and worship God. The Bible says, and a young man named Joshua followed Moses into the tabernacle of, the, the tent of meeting, into the tabernacle, and he remained there all his days and never came back out. So all the while, he was in the presence of God. All the while, he was devoted. It's called devotion. All the while, when the whole camp was living in sin, young man Joshua was devoted. Young man Joshua was in the presence of God. The ones who will turn the world upside down have to spend time in devotion, in worship. They have to spend time in the presence of God. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadows of the Almighty. He will say of the Lord, He's my refuge and my strength, in the Lord in whom I trust. He put all of his heart, he put all of his hope, he put all of his dreams, he put all of his aspirations in God. He was devoted, he was committed. He didn't join the other guys to worship idols. He didn't stay at the door watching, you know, watching Moses go to, go, go, to, go to the tent of meeting, go to the place of prayer. He stayed on the, he went to the place of prayer. He didn't come back, he stayed there. God didn't destroy him. He stayed there in the presence where the Ark of the Covenant was. He stayed in the presence of the Holy Spirit. He stayed in the place of worship. He stayed in the place of prayer. He spent time, ample time in the presence of God. We raise Christians today. Christians today, don't, we don't read the Bible anymore. We don't pray any longer. We are no longer devoted. We are not committed to the word. Listen to me. If you study the word of God, if you spend time in fellowship with God, you will take the nations for Christ. It's, it's that simple. If you spend time in the presence of God, you will have direction in life. You will know what to do and how to do it. You will know where to go and where not to go. You will hear the voice of God all the time because you know him, because you spend time with him. How many people are so passionate, you're in love with somebody, but you don't want to, you don't want to be in their presence? What kind of love? How does that work? You're so crazy in love with somebody, but you don't want to be in their presence. Myself and my wife started dating when we were in 100 level. Hey, don't, don't, don't laugh. We were the first year in university, I think 1997, something like that. 96, 97, I can't remember exactly now, but you know. And I remember then that I used to worry that, oh, this one that we're in the same faculty. She studied computer engineering, I studied chemical engineering. And we're in the same faculty every single day. Guess what? For like five years that we studied engineering, we literally saw each other almost every single day until we went for um, industrial training or something like that. We saw literally almost every single day. And I wasn't tired of seeing her because I was in love with her because she's in love with me. 
until today we're, we've been married now about 10 years. December will be 10 years. When we're still in love, and we, by the grace of God, we will remain like that forever because we appreciate, because we love each other. It's not because we don't have problems. It's not because challenges don't come. But because we, we are, we've spent enough time to understand each other. We were together, I think, eight and a half years before we even got married. You know, so we've been, like, so glued together. we become very good friends. And I want you to use that kind of intim intimacy to understand our relationship with God. It's not as though that the kind of love you have towards God is the one I have towards my wife, you know. But the kind of love you have towards God as your father, as your husband, as your wife, as is, is, is all of that sum together. It's still not big enough. It shouldn't be big enough. You know what First John says? First John chapter 1 says, he says, oh, he was talking about fellowship, the church fellowship. And he says, but really and truly and truly our fellowship is what? It's with Jesus with God our Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. When you come into that place of devotion, when you know that when you are stepping into Clary Street and, and you're coming to church, what you're really doing is you're going to the presence of your Father. When you know that when you kneel down by your bedside, you are in the presence of your Father. As a matter of fact, when you're in the toilet, you are in the presence of your Father. Everywhere you go, when you're in front of that judge, when you're in front of that pastor, or you're in front of that teacher, when you're standing and talking to your children, when you're dealing with a difficulty, when you're kicking the ball in the street, whatever you're doing, even in your sleep, you know that that you carry your presence. You commit yourself to devotion and consecration because you know that you're a child of God. You're a child of destiny. You are going somewhere. You're not just here by hamsters. You're not just here by chance. You are going somewhere. You're going somewhere. You're going somewhere to bring glory and honor and praise to the name of God. You're going somewhere to show forth the glory of God. You're going somewhere to exalt the name of the Lord. He says the mountain of the lost shall be exalted as chief, as the biggest amongst other mountains and all the nations of the earth will run into it. Are you ready to lift up the name of God? Are you ready to lift up the mountain of God? Are you ready to be an example? Are you ready to show the pathway? Are you ready to be like Nehemiah and Ezra who showed the way, the people the way and despite the attack of Sambalak, the Tobiah and Gashen, they still, they withstood their ground. They motivated the people. They rebuilt the temple. They restored the glory back to Zion. Are you one of those people that God can count on to bring back the glory to Zion? Are you one of those people that God can count on to bring glory back to Zion? Are you one of those people that can give everything that you have for the goodness of, God, of the Lord? God is not asking you for any other thing that he has not given you. God is not asking you for what he has not given you. Do you not see what happened to Abraham? Did you not see what happened to Abraham? Did you not see what happened to Abraham? God is not asking you for what he has not given you already. And he's not going to take it from you. When you release it to him, he's going to give it back to you. I don't know how God operates. I'm not God. But I've seen it over and over and over and over and over again. That he will give it back to us. We are like children, many of us. You know when you give your child, give them a you know, chicken, you know, like drumstick. And you say, hey, let me have it back. Like, no. Not knowing that the entire basket of the goodie is right with you. The entire bucket of the chicken is with you. And you give them one and you say, okay, let me have that back. Maybe you want to give them a bigger one. They said, no, no. And that's how many of us are. We're holding on so much to those things that we think are so important. But really and truly, you're not going to find fulfillment in those things. Should, should we rise up and pray? Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord a clap this morning. Give the Lord a clap this morning. Give the Lord a clap this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise be the name of the Lord. Praise be to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Should we just lift our hands up in the house this morning? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for your word this morning because your word brings hope, brings deliverance. Lord, we want to change our world. We want to turn the world around. We want to set example. We want to show how life should be lived. We want to be an example. In, we want our marriages in church to be an example. Our, the, our career, we want it to be an example to the world. We're no longer looking for, you know, what to do, what to do, what to do. We're looking for what God wants us to do. We're looking for the heart of God. We're reaching out for your heart this morning, Father. Lord, restore to us that passion. We know we're in the end times, O God, where the love of many will wax cold. But we are not of them that wax cold. We are of them that wax stronger. Lord, as many as do not yet know you in this house this morning, bring them to a conviction that they will be able to repent and commit their hearts to Jesus. I pray for everyone who has been touched by the sound of my voice this morning, that the Holy Spirit will not leave them alone until they make a decisive decision to follow you. 
in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, touch every man, every woman, every boy, every girl in this place today. Lord, let them not remain the same in the name of Jesus. Let your word touch them. Let your power prevail upon them. Let your anointing rest upon them. Let your glory fall. Let your anointing rest upon them. Let your glory fall. That they will never be able to remain the same again in the mighty name of Jesus. Bring them alive again. Bring them alive again in the name of Jesus. Every lackadaisical attitude, every, you know, you wasted time, restore to them the wasted days and wasted years of ministry. Lord, give them an assignment. Bring them to that place. Bring them to that place where they will bring smile and joy to the nations. Bring them to that place where they will serve you in your house. They will serve you like never before. That the glory of the Lord will be revealed again in Portsmouth. That the glory of the Lord will be revealed in Amsterdam. That the glory of the Lord will be revealed in England. That the glory of the Lord will be revealed in the United Kingdom. Oh, that the glory of the Lord will be revealed in the nations of the earth. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I ask Father today that a fire will start in this house. I ask fire, oh God. Call for fire from heaven, a burning, fervent fire, the passionate fire, a longing for the heart of God. Let it burn in this place. Let a new fire come down. Let your glory come upon your people. Let them come to a place, oh God, that they will never remain the same again. Let no one fall down flat any longer, but let them rise up and be strong like an army of the Lord in the name of Jesus. Everyone struggling with sin, everyone struggling with unrighteousness, today in the name of Jesus, receive the grace to live above sin. Receive the hand of God upon you to lift you out of the abyss in the name of Jesus. For many of you are not quite clear. I pray today in the name of Jesus, the purpose will come to you aspiration and hope will materialize in you and you will find a reason to live again. You, for those of you who are just so broad of life, you are depressed, you are so perplexed about life, you don't find any reason to wake up again. I decree for you today, in the name of Jesus, new hope, new dreams, in the name of Jesus. I want to pray for those of you who are in between decisions. You are in between decisions. Should I move? Should I stay? Should I go? Should I stay? Should I do this? Should I do that? Maybe, maybe not. I pray for you today. In the mighty name of Jesus, you will hear a voice clear as clear, clear as a voice of a man saying clearly to you, this is the way to go. Walk you in it. This is the right decision to make. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray for the leadership of this church that there will be an expansion in their heart. They will be able to expand in ministry. They will be able to conquer more ground. They will be able to gain conquer more ground, pull down barriers, barriers in the workplace, barriers in the economy, barriers in the council, barriers in law, barriers, barriers in government, everything that has stood itself against the advancement of this church, but the authority that is in the name of God, I command such wars to be pulled down today, in the name of Jesus, I pray Father today, in the name of Jesus, that every child born into the families in this church, they will follow the way of the Lord, from the youngest to the oldest of them, they will follow the way of the Lord, they will follow the way of the Lord, they will follow the way of the Lord, they will follow the way of the Lord in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Let your glory fall in this house. Let, there be, let the freshness of your anointing rest upon every soul. Let there be a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. Let there be a freshness from above. Let there be a freshness from above. 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 Receive you the Holy Ghost in the mighty name of Jesus. Freshness from above. Freshness from above in the mighty name of Jesus. Vitality. Newness. In the name of Jesus, that the, that the name of the Lord may be glorified. These ones are the ones turning the world right side up. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. I'm sure we can do better than that. We, we have just received from the Lord, I'm telling you, timely message, uh, the will of God that we have just received. So I'd just like us to pray for Pastor BJ. I'd like us to stretch for the hand uh, to him. I'd like us to pray for grace to be multiplied to him. I want us to pray that God's hand will come upon him afresh. I want us to pray that there will be divine endorsement. In the name of Jesus. I'd like us to pray that the anointing will be fresh each day. Each day, oh God, keep it fresh. Keep it fresh. Keep it fresh. Keep it fresh. Keep it fresh, Lord. In the name of Jesus. He that water shall be watered, the liberal soul shall be made fat. He came to us in the fullness of the blessing of the Lord, and we want to bless him back in the name of Jesus. Bless him, bless his, 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 his wife, his family. 
uh, the ministry that God has, has committed into his hand, uh, the, 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 the town of business talk, that God will multiply grace to all of them in the name of Jesus. Lord, we give you thanks. We give you worship, Lord. We bless your name, Lord. Fill him afresh, O oh God. Let your grace come upon him in a new dimension. And let your anointing remain fresh on his life in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Amen. I think we should give God a big, big, big hand for that word. Amen. Receive it. Amen. God, God bless you, BJ. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. So we, we want to continue to worship the Lord, and we're going to give to the Lord. Now, uh, I'm sure the choir, they, they are prepared uh, before now to sing uh, what they're going to sing to collect offering. But I, I think uh, we should continue to pray. Uh, and and we just we're going to take a song which is also a prayer, uh, because the message a message of consecration a message of devotion, and of course we didn't have enough time to pray. I would love for us to to just stay, uh, and and push a little bit more in the place of prayer, uh, because we don't have time. So we're going to take him, uh, consecrate me, Lord, to Thy service, Lord. Uh, we're going to, we're going to sing that as we give our offering uh, to the Lord. Uh, so that we can we sing that it's a prayer we sing it prayerfully and we trust the lord to do what he alone can do in our lives amen praise god
Oh yes, Lord. Put your hands on us afresh this day, O God. We lay it, O God, upon the altar of consecration. Near our blessed Lord.